Um, welcome, everybody, and uh, well done to you for all navigating the rain, the wind, the doors that are apparently locked to keep people out. Um, it's, uh, we've got it all going on this evening. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this, our fourth and, and final professorial lecture in, in this year's um, series. Next week, we go into um, the promotions round again, so um, by uh, by the end of the year, we will we'll have a new crop of, of professors that we'll be able to celebrate next year. Um, it's a really important occasion for us to uh, mark the uh, uh, appointment of our new professorial um, colleagues um, and to provide an opportunity to uh, celebrate their really, really significant achievements um, and to give you an opportunity to get a sense of what it is that they've spent their time thinking and working on. Um, my name's Helen Sullivan. I'm the Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific, and I have uh, the very great privilege of chairing these sessions. Um, as we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the lands and airwaves that we are meeting on, the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and pay my respects to all First Nations Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, work and play. Um, and also pay my respect to elders past and present. Um, tonight's event is to celebrate and recognise Professor Benjamin Penny's contributions to research and teaching in the college. Uh, Professor Penny, you can't see because he's sitting behind me. We've choreographed this really well, as you can you can see. Uh, this is because we all just do what Luca tells us. So there'll be a big reveal and Ben will appear to you um, as if by magic. Um, one of the things we do when we um, we prepare these uh, notes is we ask the lecturers to give us some insights into maybe what they might want us to say, some things about them that we don't know, um, and uh, it, it you know, produces some fascinating uh, and sometimes unrepeatable facts. Uh, but uh, Ben chose not to, to share any of that uh, with us. Um, largely, he tells me on the advice of, of Gillian, who uh, cautioned against some of the things he wanted to say. So if you want to know what those things are, you'll have to ask him afterwards. Um, but what I would say is that Ben is one of the, the very first people that I worked with here at the ANU when I was the new director of Crawford School. Uh, ben was then um, directing the Centre for China in the World and uh, doing an extraordinarily good job in a very, very difficult set of circumstances. Um, since then, he's been given time off for, for good behaviour and uh, given the opportunity to, to focus more on his research and his teaching. Um, his research, as some of you will know, examines religious and spiritual movements in modern and contemporary China, as well as in medieval times, Taiwanese religion and society, and expatriate society in the treaty ports in the 19th century. It's a pretty broad uh, research agenda. Um, he is a great person to have um, a drink with, although he can't drink anymore, so uh, it's more for us. But um, he is a wonderful conversationalist and a, and a really great uh, presenter. So I'm really looking forward to uh, to the lecture this evening. Um, as is usual, um, the lecturer will speak for about 40 minutes, then there'll be opportunity for Q&A, and then we'll have some time for uh, refreshments. But um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Benjamin Penny. Um, thank you so much, Helen. Um, let me also acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples and the unceded land on which we meet, traditional owners thereof, um, and um, just say that thank Helen very much for her introduction and um, it's very good to be set up. You have been set up for the best part of an hour of disappointment, so there we are. Um, so um, I'm going to read this because there's, I wanted to get a lot in and I know that if I don't read it then I would just blather. So um, when I was asked to do this lecture, I thought it might be best to introduce and discuss some of my recent work. The two pieces that form the source material for this lecture are my book, published just last week, um, A Young Englishman in Victorian Hong Kong, 
and a chapter, as you can see, entitled Jungling's Birth, uh, which is for a festschrift for a very leading colleague, one of the leaders in the study of Taoist religion, a man called Fabrizio Pregadio. But having decided on this course, I wondered what, if anything, these two topics had in common. This lecture then is partly an exercise for me in locating what lies beneath various strands in my research and discovering what it is I value in the way I approach different features of the Chinese world. So I'd like to begin by re revisiting some religious texts I studied in my PhD thesis and which I've returned to periodically since. This is a collection of uh, biographies of notable Taoists that was compiled in the fourth century, traditionally ascribed to the famous polymath Go Hong. One of these biographies, um, in one of these biographies is the first we have that tells the story of this gentleman, Zhang Ling, uh, who was the founder of the Taoist religion. Um, this status meant that at some time in the medieval period, we don't really know when, he had the word Tao, as in Taoism, attached to his name, so he became Zhang Dao Ling, which is how he's best known now. His traditional dates have him being born in the year 34 of the Common Era in the Eastern Han Dynasty and ascending bodily to heaven in 156. The founding of Taoism is dated to the year 142 when he received a revelation from a god called Lord Lao the Most High when he was already 108, if you do the arithmetic. Lord Lao is the deified form of Lao Tzu, the putative author of the ancient philosoph philosophical text, the Tao Te Ching, or the way in its power, to use a well-known translation. Lao Tzu was meant to have lived some five or 600 years before the revelation happened. Now, formal Chinese biographies from as far back as we have them uh, begin in a standard way. They say such and such a person whose alternative name or names was so-and-so was a person from a particular place. Um, the case I've just mentioned of Zhang Ling says Zhang Ling, courtesy name Fu Han, was a person of the Principality of Pei. Uh, the Principality of Pei was located um, in northeast China with its capital in um, modern-day Anhui, it's the top dot there. It is in the nature of Chinese historical and literary traditions that data like this gets repeated and endorsed each time a new version of the biography is produced, even while that biography may add new incidents and anecdotes. This tradition can be characterised as accretative. Revising, or worse still, starting afresh, are somehow disrespectful. In the last couple of years, some colleagues and students and I have been meeting in an informal research group to study a fragmentary collection of Taoist biographies from the 11th century. This collection includes a biography of Zhang Daoling, but surprisingly, in this version of his life, his birthplace has shifted. In this text, and many since, it's said that he was born on Mount Tiamu which translates as Mount Heaven's Eye or Mount Heavenly Eye. Mount Tianmu is about 80 kilometres west of present-day Hangzhou, which is the, the red dot down there. And that's more than 600 kilometres from where the Principality of Pei uh, was during the Han Dynasty. And there's no mountain near Pei with any name like this, so changing Jungling's place of origin must have been intentional. Um, I'll just draw your attention to this dot over here as well. That's in the old state of Shu, the old um, area of Shu. I'll get to that later, just so you know what that dot is. So Mount Tianmu is now designated a national nature reserve and is famous for its giant Japanese cedars that you can see here. It's also a designated UNESCO biosphere reserve. It's not now a no particularly notable religious site, although it does have this temple on top of it, it's a, um, it's a Buddhist temple. Uh, it's fairly dull when you get up close, um, but nonetheless, it is a Buddhist temple. Traces of jungling are, however, present on the mountain, including an otherwise unremarkable rock overhang called Lord Jung's Lodge, which that is there. 
Um, in local treatises going back to the 13th century, there are references to other sites nearby that refer to Jungling, including the intriguingly named mountain where the immortal was born. In other words, in the period following Jung's acquisition of a new birthplace, there was clearly important religious activity in the vicinity. Exactly what the nature and size of this activity was is now hard to determine, but its traces are still clear on the landscape. To appreciate why the analysis of this apparently small change, small, this apparently small change in biographical data has much broader ramifications, we must return to the original biography that I mentioned earlier. That fourth century record is, as I said, the earliest biography that now exists, or indeed has existed for probably 1500 years, of the founder of one of China's most influential religious traditions. However, Looking closely at that biography early as it is, it's clear that it's actually an amalgam of two earlier sources, whether written or oral, we don't know. Unpicking these Ur texts presents us with two different traditions related to Zhang Ling. The first presents him as an individual lone religious seeker, a little like that in this execrable picture. Um, He's a minor official who decides to pursue the way of physical immortality uh, through the concoction of an elixir, the recipe for which he obtained by, uh, from a text called the Yellow Emperor's Elixir Method of the Nine Tripods. Here are nine tripods. You can count them. Um, the, in this stratum of text, he succeeds in his task and attains immortality rising bodily into the clouds, but not before he passes on his secrets to two disciples who've proved themselves worthy of such an honor. In the second stratum, Zhang is characterized as the leader of a community of believers and the recipient of a new dispensation from heaven, the revelation that established Taoism as a religion. The powers that were granted to him supernaturally allowed him to become a healer and the biography tells us his, numbers, his followers numbered thousands of families. As leader, both religious and terrestrial, he established the religious bio bureaucracy that later transformed into the, the Taoist clerical system and taught rituals of confession and absolution. These two textual strata represent two of the fundamental streams of Taoism in its earliest phases, the individual and the collective the alchemical and the ritual, the independent and unconventional versus the organizational and regulated. We find these two streams represented in many early Taoist biographies, but Zhang's is alone in bringing them together. To return to my theme of locality, in the early medieval period, they also appear to have been based in different regions of what we now call China. The first in the Northeast, where Zhang was initially said to have come from, the second in the region of Shu, the western half of what is now Sichuan, where that dot over this side of the screen was. This geographical split is seen in the biography too. Early on in the record, Zhang shifts his residence from the principality of Pei to Shu because he had heard that the people there were pure, teachable, and there were lots of mountains. This strikes me as a rather flimsy reason for traveling some 1,600 kilometers overland. And bear in mind, he allegedly did this in about 100 of the common era, when aged 76. Almost certainly, this short passage is a piece of textual sticky tape used to put the two earlier sources together. So with two streams of biography that date from before about 340 of the common era that are associated with different localities and different religious practices and traditions, let's move forward again to the 11th century record, which tells us that Zhang Ling was born on Tian Mushan. 700 years after the first biography, many new features appear in this version of the life. I'd like to discuss two briefly, an ancestry and the circumstances of his conception and birth. In this later record, the minor official is now credited with being the eighth generation descendant of no less a figure than Zhang Liang. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with Zhang Liang, he was one of the chief advisors and allies of Liu Bang, 
who would become the first emperor of the Han Dynasty. Considered one of the great military strategists of his era, his prowess was said to have come from a text bestowed on him by a strange hermit with powerful mystical qualities called Huang Shugong, or Lord Yellow Rock. This is Lord Yellow Rock on the right, giving the text to Zhang Liang on the left. Besides sharing the family name Zhang, which is one of China's most common family names, there is no external evidence to support this ancestry. But being linked through the father's line to a great and noble ancestor with quasi-magical powers must have been strong evidence of his own special status. In addition, the 11th century version grants Jungling an elaborate and wondrous birth story. And here it is, so you can read along with me if you wish. His mother first dreamed that a heavenly man descended to earth from the Kuei star of the Northern Dipper. That's the top star in, in the stars of the Northern Dipper. He was more than one Jung tall and wore brocaded clothes. He transmitted a fragrance to her. When she woke up, her clothes and the room were suffused with this marvellous scent. After a month, it had still not dispersed. She became pregnant in response to it. On the full moon in the first month of the 10th year of the general rain period of Emperor Guangwu of the Eastern Han, a Jia Wu year in the cycle, he was born on Mount Tianwu in the territory of Wu. At that time, a yellow cloud covered the room and purple qi filled the courtyard. Inside the room, there was bright qi like the sun and moon and the same fragrance as before could be detected after 10 days the fragrance dispersed. There follows a description of Zhang himself that it's full of details concerning his numinous physiognomy and his precocious talents. In other words, by this stage in history, Zhang had become, if not a demigod, certainly an extraordinary man marked with the signs of being fated for great things. This is a really horrible Qing dynasty uh, sculpture of the Kuei star spirit. And you can see in his right hand that wiry thing are the stars of the Northern Dipper that he's holding there. Um, this is Zhang Ling himself in a mode I'll talk about in a moment, but you'll see also the same seven stars of the Northern Dipper at the top. This new version of Zhang Ling also acquired new powers and new narratives. Primary among them are stories of, ex of his exploits fighting demonic ghosts in order, as the text put it, to, quote, keep the world of ghosts separate from the world of men. On the basis of the new dispensation Zhang Ling had been granted by Lord Lao, his cleansing of the land relieved the people of providing blood sacrifices to their unpleasant otherworldly overlords. At this point in the discussion, it's important to note that around the time, around this time, new Taoist dispensations were also in the air in court circles. The Song Emperor Junzong, this guy, who reigned from 997 to 1022, famously dreamt of Taoist gods and gained extra legitimacy from them when they bestowed numinous heavenly writings on him. This was only a few decades earlier than when the new version of Zhang Ling's biography came together. The Song court in Junzong's time was in Bianjing, now Kaifeng, but Lin'an, now Hangzhou, was one of its major centres. Mount Tianmu is, as I noted above, not very far from Hangzhou. And in 1138, after the fall of the north to the non-Chinese Jurchen, the court itself moved south to Hangzhou, or Lin'an, as it was. To draw some threads together, a new set of stories about Zhang Daoling, where he acts as the agent of heaven to cleanse a polluted world, new dispensation in hand, and established as a pure community, appears only a matter of decades after a new emperor is bestowed with powerful tokens of heavenly legitimacy, thus granting his reign the cachet of a special mandate. Indeed, on the appearance of the heavenly writings, the emperor changed his reign title to the auspicious talent, sorry, the auspicious tally of the great centre to reflect his new status. The texts that present the new stories about Zhang arbitrarily move his birthplace to the vicinity of one of the new dynasty's major centres. When the north fell, the contemporary location of Pei, Zhang's original place of origin, was well within the territory of the conquerors. We might speculate that the religious administrators of Mount Tianmu knew a good thing when they saw it, 
And having established a new base for Zheng Daoling veneration near Lin'an, they played their hand for all it was worth when the refugee court took up residence nearby. Zheng Daoling, according to the tradition, was not just the founder of the Taoist religion. He was also the founder of a lineage of leaders of that religion. He was posthumously granted the title Celestial Master Zhang, and each of the subsequent holders of this esteemed leadership position were also members of the Zhang family, usually the previous Celestial Master's son, and given the title Celestial Master in turn. By the time of the Junzong Emperor, the lineage was supposedly up to the middle 20s. The last generally accepted Celestial Master was this gentleman, who was number 63, and he died in 1969. In the 19th century, Protestant missionaries who were not particularly impressed with Taoism or Roman Catholicism understandably referred to the Celestial Masters as the Taoist popes. Typically, institutionalized religions like to represent their histories as beginning at a certain point of rupture in the fabric that divides this world and the other world. God being made man in the person of Jesus, the Buddha attaining enlightenment, Yahweh making a special covenant with Abraham, Gabriel's revolution, uh, revolution, revelation of the Quran to Muhammad, and Lord Lao's revelation to Zhang Daoling. Understandably, given the centrality of these especially numinous moments, the human person concerned often became the focus of veneration, and their biography in turn is taken as emblematic. Moreover, within each tradition or sub-tradition, stories are told of the handing down of teachings or charisma or authority. These origin and transmission stories are the basis of the legitimacy of the religious institution at any particular time and place and are crucial to the way that religion defines itself. Taoism is no different in this from most other institutionalized religions. The story of the life of Zhang Daoling and the step-by-step inheritance through the celestial master lineage produces the authority and legitimacy of the sacred institution at any specific time. This is, to use uh, Leotard's term, the grand narrative of Taoism. A special feature of the grand narratives of religions is that they tend to be unchallenged, even unchallengeable, from within because they are matters of universal and cosmic history, which followers of the religion have signed up to. I've shown in this lecture that there are three distinct sets of stories about Zhang Daoling that come from different times and places. As the centuries rolled by, the pre-existing biographical data were overlaid by new material, but were typically preserved in the new form of the biography. Imagine you were practicing Taoist in northeast China in the third century, or one in the southwest, perhaps from a little earlier, or in the new Song Dynasty capital in the 12th. The stories about the origin of your religion would be more or less cogent, and the state of your religion at that time would be justified by a story of how it had been handed down to that present point. But the origin and transmission stories you would hear would be very different from each other. In other words, there would be three non-commensurable grand narratives. The grand narrative, the, the sweep of history, the macro story, these are the tools of an institutional and cultural regime of totalization, the justification and legitimization of power, or at least the claim to power. Dismantling the story of Zhang Daoling's life, as I've tried to show, does not rely on grand gestures. It focuses on small data, worrying over an apparently minor change in birthplace as a dog might worry sheep, picking away at different texts that say almost the same thing, reading slowly, a phrase I will return to. I would not want to conclude this part of the discussion here and leave you with the impression that this is simply an exercise in debunking the accepted story. Rather, by teasing out the process of accretion, observing closely the nature of the new data that have been laid down and contextualizing those changes in time and place, the complex history of the religion that lies behind the neat institutional stories can be revealed. To put it another way, the grand narratives have both a genealogy and a geology. They can be understood and analyzed in their own right, 
as artifacts of their own locations, both temporal and geographic. This is what I like to call, what I like to think of as the philological method. Philology is often thought of as the determination of meaning at the level of the word. But as Zilkowski reminded us, it also involves restoring to words as much of their original life and nuances as we can manage. To read the written records of bygone civilizations correctly requires knowledge of cultural history in a broad sense, of folklore, legends, lore, and laws and customs. Philology also encompasses the forms in which texts express their messages, and thus it included stylistics, metrics, and similar studies. Tsiolkovsky is a scholar of Latin and the European medieval, but this description, when focused on China, could serve as a, as a definition of sinology, a discipline I am happy to say it is becoming once more acceptable to cleave to. I promised earlier to return to the definition of philology as the art of reading slowly, ascribed alternatively to Nietzsche and Roman Jakobson. Tsiolkovsky comments on this pithy declaration by recalling a statement of his Byzantinist colleague, Ihor Shevchenko, who said, philology is constituting and interpreting the texts that have come down to us. It is a narrow thing, but without it, nothing else is possible. In practice, as we sinologists know only too well, discussion of old texts often comes down to determining precisely what the shortest of passages means, where the sentence breaks should be, whether a word is a personal name or title or place or just a normal word, and whether a character has been written incorrectly and many other textual minutiae. These are undoubtedly small data, but without getting them right or as right as we can, nothing else is possible. The philological method then is a way of working with texts, or as I hope to show later, historical interpretation more broadly, that pays attention and gives respect to the smallest textual unit, the individual life and the locality. In classical philology and its cousin textual criticism, one of the primary dicta is lectio difficilior potior, or the difficult reading is the stronger. In practice, this means that when comparing two versions of the same text where there, are where there are alternative readings, it's more likely that the original is the odd or strange or inexplicable one. The logic behind this is that as texts are passed from hand to hand, <clears throat> editors or copyists will tend to replace words they do not understand with words they do. They tend to make the text clean and smooth and easily understood but introduce errors by doing so. In a parallel case, it seems to me that in histories of religion, maybe in histories generally, stories in which the ends are all tied up neatly should immediately be distrusted. I would go further and assert that the grander the narrative, the neater the story must be. <clears throat> this not only renders the story inaccurate, but still worth studying in its own right, but also smooths away the outliers, the lumpy bits, and the uncomfortable. In other words, the texture that makes the history of humans interesting. I'd now like to move on <clears throat> to another aspect of my work, this one reflected in my book, A Young Englishman in Victorian Hong Kong, now available from the ANU Press to read and download free. This book concerns one Chalonor Alabaster, who left England in 1855 to go to Hong Kong as a student interpreter with the British China Consular Service. He ended up serving as a British diplomat in China his whole career and most of his life, returning to England as Sir Chalonor Alabaster in 1892. My book is based on the diaries he wrote nightly over the first 15 months he was in Hong Kong. Over a number of years now, I've been fascinated by the pioneering early sinological works of Protestant missionaries in China in the 19th century. One of the main archives for these material is in the London University School of Oriental and African Studies. Some time ago, while waiting for a collection of missionary correspondence to appear from the store, I was idly inputting various keywords into the catalogue. One was diary. One of the entries 
was for a multi-volume handwritten written set of diaries by this man that I had never heard of and never seen written about. Of course, I called them up. And here we are. So, Alabaster. Alabaster led a life defined by British colonialism. As I wrote in the introduction, Alabaster was a deeply committed servant of the British Empire and was curious about what he saw around him. Unfortunately, for many foreign observers of China, not to mention Chinese authors, what was seen on the streets they walked each day rapidly became normalized or trivial or ordinary and not worth recording. For the newly arrived Alabaster, however, everything was new and strange. And in the diaries he wrote, without the jaded knowingness of the long-term expatriate. The diaries also have the immediacy of a daily journal, preserving Alabaster's first thoughts on a subject, with no awareness of how the events he described would turn out. He could not know if one of the many diseases he and everybody else suffered would lead to death, if a minor skirmish would develop into a battle, or if his interest in one of Hong Kong's young British ladies would become serious. It lacks the careful editing and judicious hindsight of journalism, of histories, or of memoirs, which always have a weather eye to either a current readership or to posterity. Alabaster's diaries are, are exceptional for the way they focus on a specific time and place. Here's Hong Kong, for example, um, was only what we now call Hong Kong Island and then only the portion from Shengwan to Happy Valley. The area on which buildings could be built was also much smaller. Hong Kong's extraordinary land reclamation project had only just begun. The harbour that you see here from 1862, roughly, was originally more than twice as wide as it is now. This is the same view now from the same place, so you can't see the harbour at all. Um, this is where Alabaster lived. Uh, that building doesn't exist anymore. It was demolished in 1934. But that's the, the peak behind that you can see was incredibly rocky and bare at the time. This is the same one now. So it's a um, very different kind of place. Um, the sides of the peak and the other mountains above the settlement of Victoria were not green but bare rock. Socially, Chinese and foreigners lived quite separately although there was a considerable amount of interaction, licit and illicit. This was where the Chinese people lived, in a place called Taiping Shan. In the remainder of this lecture, I hope to show how attending closely to Alabaster's record of Hong Kong, personal and limited as it is, helps us dismantle some of the larger stories of 19th century history that claim to encompass territory far from the Pearl River Delta. In this task, I will use a similar methodology that I've demonstrated with the biography of Zhang Daoling. One of the most important developments in Hong Kong history in recent decades has been a specific focus on Hong Kong itself and the interaction of all its communities. This Hong Kong school, as Christopher Munn calls it, contrasts with histories written from the position of the colony's elite, the colonial school, or those intent on seeing the history through the lens of China's, quote, 100 years of humilia national humiliation, at the hands of foreigners, the Beijing school. Although Mun doesn't venture into this territory, both these latter schools subscribe to historical narratives that are constructed by and through specific politics in which Hong Kong is a small though important element. In the former case, Hong Kong was one colony among many that were linked through networks of trade and commerce and that benefited from the legal, educational, religious, health, financial, and other systems the British brought with them. In the latter case, Hong Kong was among the first Chinese territories excised from the motherland through war, and was the focal point for the malevolent opium trade that held China back from its proper place in the world. In both cases, Hong Kong's own history, the life of its people, and its existence as a community in and of itself disappear. We might also say that these versions of history take away the right of Hong Kong people to a history of their own. In both cases, they are made subservient to the macro stories emanating from London or Beijing. 
We should also, however, be aware, beware of constructing a new narrative for Hong Kong's own development where disparate communities of Chinese, Indians, British, and many others came together in an entrepot society inspired by the spirit of entrepreneurship and blessed with freedom and low taxation created the Pearl of the Orient. Applying what I've called the philological method to this history, how does Alabaster's diary help us to deconstruct the narratives of British colonial glory or Chinese humiliation? First, in these versions of history, what's become known in shorthand as the colonial project or the colonial enterprise is viewed as somehow unified set of actions. For the Chinese, this is rendered in the phrase foreign powers or Western powers, which is taken to include Britain, France, Germany, the US, Russia, later on Japan, and sometimes Italy and Austria-Hungary. In British colonial history, although the presence of the other colonizing powers is acknowledged, Britain reigned supreme. What becomes clear when we focus down on to the Hong Kong of Alabaster's time was that the foreign powers were anything but unified. The British and French were fighting the Crimean War with Russia, including in the Pacific theater. The British and Americans were at diplomatic, diplomatic loggerheads over, amongst other things, US adventurism in Nicaragua. This was so serious that Alabaster concluded, as you can see here on this page of his diary, war seems inevitable with America. It's actually um, um, about the fifth line down, if you can read his writing. Uh, he also rejoiced in the arrest of the US consul when he aided the escape of an American seaman who had been detained by the British authorities. Great news, he wrote in the diary. See, his writing was a little better on that day. The Spanish coolie trade, in which Chinese people from coastal cities were brutally trafficked to Cuba in this period, passing through Hong Kong first, was severely criticised and attacked by British residents and officials. Within Hong Kong society itself, Alabaster's diary reveals very little interaction between the various European communities, who seem to have kept themselves pretty much to themselves, and as I noted above, none of them ventured into the Chinese settlement without exceptional cause. Even within the British community, the owners of the big business and trading houses and the diplomatic community had little to do with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. The military were largely a world unto themselves and the missionary contingent were politely tolerated at best. One of the main issues that caused division in the British community was opium. The big trading houses of the time, Jardines, Dents and Russells, were all major players in the opium trade, but the governor of the time, Sir John Bowering, was opposed to it. Alabaster was also fiercely antagonistic. The opium trade is a, truly a gigantic evil, and one which will, if not stopped in time, ruin first China, then India, and damage England much. Some damage it has already done. If we continue the trade, we dishonor ourselves, disobey our God, impoverish and demoralize China and India, which we are doing rapidly. If it be stopped gradually in 10 years, China and Chinese trade will be twice as flourishing as it is now. But we must expect a row, for the merchants are powerful and a rash stoppage would raise a commotion, not only among the merchants, but among the Chinese. To take another example of how the diaries can be used, one of the key points in the narratives of British supremacy and Chinese national humiliation was the Second Opium War. This is also called the Arrow War, as its proximate cause was the seizure of a small cargo vessel called the Arrow that sailed under the British flag but was crewed by Chinese. This isn't the Arrow, but it was like the Arrow. In, on October the 8th, 1856, the Chinese authorities, suspecting the Arrow of smuggling, arrested most of the crew and pulled down the Union Jack. This was observed by a nearby British captain on another vessel who reported it to the British authorities. The British consul in Canton demanded the release of all the crew and also an apology for insulting the flag from the governor, known in English as Commissioner Ye Ming Chen. That's this chap. Ye released nine of the 12 crew but gave no apology. 
In an entirely predictable escalation, given the bad terms between the Canton and Hong Kong authorities, on October the 23rd, the British and French bombarded the city of Canton from warships in the river, broke the walls, occupied the city, and captured Commissioner Yeh. This effectively transformed the war into a major military contestation and led ultimately to the Anglo-French march on Beijing and the destruction of the Imperial Summer Palace. However, in the diaries, the first we hear of what is now called the War of Canton was on October the 20th, three days before the bombing commenced, when Alabaster notes, the Canton affair is not settled yet. This nonchalance speaks not just to a char characteristic theme in the diaries, namely that the various military actions that Alabaster was proximate to were of far less importance than anything going on in Europe, but also of the way witnesses to historical events do not know what they will lead to or how they will end up. Reading these two examples from the diaries slowly cannot but affect the way we view the grand narratives of 19th century history. First, they suggest that colonialism was messy. If we wish to see the various foreign powers as acting in unison with one agenda, we have to generalise to such an extent and smooth out the story so much that all nuance is lost, that significant differences between the foreign powers are ignored, and that the real lives of the protagonists involved become walk-on parts of cut-out characters. Secondly, the closer you look, the less clear unity of purpose appears even within one community. My example for this came from the British community since Alabaster was British. But the same process would hold if we were to examine the Portuguese, French, American, Chinese communities, presuming we had relevant documents as powerful as the Alabaster Diaries. Thirdly, history is sequential, one damned thing after another, as it is said. And for the people involved, any pattern to events that may become obvious to a later observer is plainly invisible at the time. Rather than mounting an Olympian peak to view human events from such a distance that the humans themselves are rendered indistinguishable, reading documents like Alabaster's diaries slowly and closely immerses us in the communities where history actually occurred, allowing us to feel the texture of their humanity. These are small data I've been working with, and sorting out what they mean is perhaps a narrow thing, but in Shevchenko's words, without it, nothing else is possible. Thank you. That's a map of the bombardment of Canton, and that's where we finish. Thank you. Thank you.